No, because I don't want to like two. It's not much. You come back and you go back to the
All right. Good morning. Welcome back. Let's get rolling. So um, hope your week is going well. We are moving right along in the term and getting into media ecology theory for today. Uh, so we'll have a presentation in just a little bit about that one. Um, I just want to give you a quick glance of the remaining weeks of the term so that you know what to expect. Um, again, we have uh, just about a uh, little less than four weeks left until we get to the end. So I do want to make sure we're clear about how things will look like going forward. So uh, today we have media ecology theory. Um, we'll have communication accommodation theory on Friday. Um, we have another set of three theories to discuss next week. And then the following week, um, we'll have Memorial Day where we don't have a class meeting. We'll meet on the 31st. And then just like last time, with application of paper number one, we have an attendance optional workshop day on June 2nd um, to prepare for you submitting your second application paper on Sunday, June 4th. Um, so this second application paper, again, is using one of the theories that we've talked about from week six through 10, uh, using a different artifact to analyze and make sense of um, that theory and findings that you're having from that. And then in week 10, we'll have our final trio of theories. Um, so uh, just as you're thinking and planning ahead, um, we do not meet for finals week. We don't have a formal final in this class. Um, instead, on June 15th, at the end of the term, you'll be picking one of your two application papers to submit as a final revised version. Um, so you'll be receiving feedback from me on your first application paper by the end of the week. 
You'll receive feedback on your second application paper. You'll get to choose which one you want to expand and revise a little bit. And then you'll be doing that as we head toward the finish line. So we've got some good stuff up ahead, a number of presentations, theories, and more things to go over. So uh, look forward to that. So last class, um, we um, had some time to discuss course. We also looked at the narrative paradigm, right? So rhetoric, dramatism, and narrative paradigm are basically our trio of very rhetoric-focused theories in the class um, that focus on public communication, reaching an audience, attempting to engage with that audience. So if you find yourself interested for your second application paper in an artifact that looks at a public speaker um, or presenter in that kind of setting, uh, those theories can be really good choices for you. Uh, we also heard from Lindsay and Austin, who did a great job of bringing in outside articles to talk about how the narrative paradigm has been used and applied in areas including marketing and also public perceptions about health. So um, I appreciated those uh, presentations and adding context to it. Today, we're going to be talking about media ecology theory. So we're once again shifting gears from a focus on uh, rhetoric to a focus on media and reaching broader audiences through communication. Um, second of all, we'll talk about some of the ways that uh, media ecology theory has been used, theorized, and discussed. Um, doesn't look like Angel's here today, so we'll just have Kyle, who will be giving a presentation in just a bit. Kyle, I got your stuff, and I have that ready to pull up whenever you're ready. So um, we talked a little bit about the application paper, uh, but again, for the second application paper, um, I'm happy to look over rough drafts, outlines, anything else. We'll also take some time, um, especially getting into next week, to again, help you to brainstorm and think about what you would like to do for this paper. So um, I encourage you to think about some of the later theories that we've talked about in the class and use those as you're thinking about uh, this assignment. Again, those theories are listed here. So. Um, our rhetoric trio, media ecology theory, and then the later theories that we'll be talking about. Um, some of the later, later theories, like feminist standpoint theory and cultural theory, are coming after the deadline. So you're welcome to work ahead if you want to and you're really interested in those theories. Um, otherwise, a lot of the theories we've talked about here are good candidates. So uh, questions uh, before we dive into some of the specifics of media ecology theory. All right, so media ecology theory, if we thought about some of the media theories that we've looked at in the past, uh, such as agenda setting theory, right, uh, and users and gratifications, they take contrasting perspectives on how large of an influence media has over our lives. But generally speaking, these theories have been much more positivistic and empirical. Um, but uh, in contrast, uh, media ecology theory is taking media and looking at it from a more critical and interpretive perspective. So this is why we're kind of exploring media again, but in a very different way. So media ecology theory, right, is first of all, really concerned with the ways in which media and technology have evolved, right? Um, we have gone a long way from a world before the internet, um, we've gone a long way since, um, you know, early 2000s era internet. Um, again, I grew up playing uh, the, the video game, like an online computer game, Neopets. Right, where the idea was that you had a virtual pet online. And a lot of the games were like using very early Flash. And there was this one game, like a role playing game called NeoQuest. And the idea was that you play this game, and every single time you tried to move your character a tile, like a top down RPG, the entire page had to reload for a, like a single movement. So a lot of early internet, of course, very archaic, um, you know. Uh, I find I find it wild, um, you know, seeing like babies um, like holding iPads and understanding how to use like iPads and iPhones from a very young age. Um, so we've seen a very different landscape. You know, your landscape is likely different than mine, um, and our next generation, of course, it's going to continue to look different. Um, sort of things that we take for granted, aspects of technology that we have now, um, are things that just um, you know are just the default such as, again, social media. Again, I grew up at a time where, um, you know, people had MySpace pages and people were like playing a, like Green Day or Nirvana that just auto-loaded when you went up to your uh, MySpace page and you had like absurdly obnoxious sparkling gifts of Edward from Twilight and all that stuff. So seeing some changes in how people use media. Uh, Facebook has interestingly gone down a similar direction as MySpace, which lost a lot of the appeal support as being seen 
it's catering to an older audience. Um, so all of this, the changes in technology that we've seen over time, are really a big part of media ecology theory. Another key idea here, which comes from Marshall McLuhan, our developer of this theory, um, is a term um, that we can debate, discuss, um, and examine more called the medium is the message, right? So according to Marshall McLuhan, um, the way in which the material is presented, whether it's a TV commercial, whether it's an advertisement, whether it's a TikTok, uh, whether it's a Facebook post, um, shapes what that message is, and in many ways is just as important as the content of the message itself. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Media ecology theory suggests that we cannot escape technology, right? We can't get out of the matrix, we're just in it. Um, and the dominant media of the era shapes society, right? Again, if we're thinking about really popular media, um, it enters the cultural lexicon, enters the conversation. Um, you know, a lot of people talking about Mario movies, Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, Tears of the Kingdom, right? There's a lot of things that have come out recently that have gained a lot of attention and interest. So this theory takes sociocultural and critical uh, approaches um, in terms of context application. It's mass media, right? Looking at uh, larger media and its influence in public and takes on a more critical perspective. So as we'll go into some of the later theories in the class, like cultural studies, um, one of the things that these theories are really interested in is if media, mass media, um, again, thinking about things like film and television, it's widely circulated, it has messages and it has meaning that shape our understanding of events and reality, right? So it's important to study and understand what those underlying messages and meaning is about. Um, so exploring those things is a big aspect of media ecology. As mentioned, um, Marshall McLuhan uh, was developed for media ecology theory um, and famously theorized that the medium is the message. Um, I have a short video clip that gets into this concept in a little bit more detail because I think understanding it is pretty fundamental toward understanding some of the key ideas of this theory more broadly. The medium is the message, declared Marshall McLuhan. He even wrote a book with that name except that when the proofs came back from the typesetter as the medium is the massage, he liked the mistake in the title so much he kept it. This has confused people ever since, though he might have intended a visual pun on massage and mass age. But what does the medium is the message really mean? It's a deliberately paradoxical statement. When you get a message, it's the message that's the message isn't it? The content rather than its form. McLuhan's genius was to focus on the medium itself. He argues that throughout history, what has been communicated has been less important than the particular medium through which people communicate. The technology that transfers the message changes us and changes society, the individual, the family, the work, leisure, and more. Take the shift from oral cultures to print-based ones, for example. McLuhan thought the printed word encouraged an emphasis on the visual, whereas in earlier oral cultures, when speech was everything, the dominant sense organ then the ear. The electronic media of his day, the telegraph, radio, television, and telephone, were, he thought, unifying people and encouraging participation, though perhaps at the expense of greater conformity. What was emerging was some kind of global village. It's almost as if he was writing about the internet. So uh, McLuhan, um, you can probably tell from the black and white photo and pose, um, predated the internet, right? Came before uh, media, social technology, and all of that had developed, and yet theorized uh, this idea um, in a way that in many ways we still talk about today. So it's a paradox, right? The idea that how a message is delivered is just as important or is central to what the message itself is saying. I'll give you an example, right? Um, say that a close relative of yours has passed away. Are you going to send a text and say, oh, I'm so sorry, uh, my grandma died frowny face, right? probably pretty inappropriate and out of touch with the emotions. They're probably going to call you, right? Or they might meet with you face to face or say, we need to talk. Uh, oftentimes, something like a text message in that situation wouldn't be appropriate. 
So the way that we think about the appropriate channel and means of communicating is important for the content that we're trying to get, right? Um, part of why TikTok has gained so much traction and popularity, kind of thinking back to like Vine, which this is in many ways a successor to, is because it's multimodal, right? It's a lot more engaging to have these videos that are you know, algorithmically targeted to you, that are engaging, that are thoughtful. You see the video, you see the audio, it's oftentimes very short, um, compared to, um, you know, grandma tagging you in a six paragraph long post on Facebook. So the engagement of uh, social media, um, the ability to engage in a dynamic way um, is in many ways a big part of the popularity of um, the medium itself. So McLuhan is in many ways talking about how we're using media and technology. Uh, pictured here on the right is a book called Alone Together by Shelley Turkle. Uh, Turkle's really cool. Uh, she is a um, kind of social theorist, um, researches communication, technology, and psychology. Um, and in particular is concerned with the ways in which um, while technology has developed and changed and brought new ways of bridging gaps, um, in certain ways it's also brought us further apart and the idea of being alone together. I think there's a tendency for a lot of people, including in communication, to shrug or write off um, the usage of new media and technology and say, oh, well, you know, this is just a fad, technology is ruining us, it's driving us apart, it's, um, you know, collapsing society, whatever. And I think that that misses the mark a little bit, right? There are ways in which technology has problems and might have a lack of engagement, but also ways that technology can form meaningful connections too. It's just that the landscape of how we communicate has looked really different. One thing that I've noticed over the last six or seven years, right, is um, that it's become more common practice if you have like a smartphone with you that you just like put it on the table if you're having dinner in case you get a message or text or something like that. So that's become a lot more common as a practice and again reflects uh, change in technology. In this way, um, Circle does a lot of work to examine how the usage of new technology and features shape the way that we communicate. Media infuse every act, nearly every act and action in our society. That is, um, we, in many ways, are thinking about media with regard to how we behave and how we act. Um, one way of thinking about this is perhaps uh, you and your friend go on a great trip. And um, over the course of that trip, maybe you have a really nice meal, maybe you have a really beautiful view. Um, you know, you take a photo and maybe you post that photo on Instagram, or maybe you're sharing a photo with a friend, right? I was up at Mira yesterday and I had a really nice view of the town from the hills. And so I sent that to my partner and uh, also sent it to my mom. So it's like, we think about how the usage of media is impacting our day-to-day -day lives, right? Um, we might wake up and the first thing we do is check our notifications, right? We get updates, emails, all of that. So media plays a really big role in shaping um, how we behave. And there's this interconnected relationship here. Media also fix our perceptions and organize our experiences. That is, media provide us with a framework of understanding and thinking about this. Um, one thing um, that's a good example here is how on technology like Facebook, there's the use of memories, right? So maybe there's something you posted or shared uh, you know, from many years ago. Like I got a memory that about, you know, four years ago, um, you know, I had adopted my dog and there was a picture of her as a puppy and I thought, oh, this is so cute. So the way that we understand and make sense of our history, like literally a timeline is something that media is using. And media is a way to tie the world together. Again, um, we've seen this a lot with uh, media breaking gaps. You might not like Zoom, but it was a way for people to connect and engage who otherwise couldn't. Um, and it's provided, you know, this more network form of communication. So um, in many ways, this theory suggests media has a lot of power, it has a lot of influence on our actions. So compared to something like uses and gratification, this is suggesting much more of uh, influence and role in media. So um, it's also important to think about the ecology component of media ecology theory, right? Um, if we think about what ecology is, well, ecology is about the study of environments. So if you've taken a course in environmental science, uh, biology, there's a good chance the term ecology can come up. So it's about understanding then how 
media itself is creating an environment that is really competing with lives. Right? If you're a squirrel and you live in the forest, right? The you know nuts and seeds that you gather, the tree that you live in, like the environment is going to shape the way that you behave. And in the same way, um, our mediated environment uh, shapes how we behave, how we understand, how we communicate um, and express values, beliefs, and so on. Uh, for example, if you use Reddit, perhaps there's a subreddit or forum that you like regularly check uh, and that you're interested in and use whether it's like being horrified, um, whether it's they learn, use um, that to influence our communication. So um, media create an environment for us um, through which we engage. Media ecology theory, right? Again, media ecology theory is in many ways responding to change. It's thinking about the history, the context, the background that has led us to the point that we're at right now. And if we think about what are known as historical epochs, right? We might think about uh, what's considered, uh, if we're not mine, the tribal era, which in many ways relates to uh, indigenous forms of communication, right? Developing a complex language, symbology, um, means of communicating, right? And there's a lot of complexity here. Again, I think that a lot of studies of history and communication don't always get at the nuances and development of sophisticated communication from a variety of indigenous and first nation groups. But um, as a starting point, right, much of this communication predates the development of technology and other resources. We then move into what's known as the literate era, right, where someone is considered literate, they're developing an ability to read and understand material as a skill. So um, developing uh, that skill set and recognizing, of course, the factors such as class that influence access to literacy. Um, is important in that area. And um, in many ways, if we think about, if we're talking about mass communication in any way, right, one of the biggest kind of inventions and starting points to even think about this topic is the printing press. Uh, the development of print media, whether it's like a newspaper, and again, you might think about like, uh, you know, a kid holding a paper extra, extra, right? Here's what's going on in World War II. Um, the ability to communicate to a large audience through mass printed media is crucial, right? You watch Bridgerton and there's, you know, the lady whistle down, like newsletters she sends out and makes the, everybody aware of what's going on in the relationships on the show. Um, so like the ability to circulate to a wide audience through the use of printed uh, mass media is crucial, is a game changer, and in many ways has informed a lot of the theories we've talked about, like agenda setting theory. And then, of course, we've now moved on to the electronic era. And I think there's a lot of different ways that we can break this down, right? Um, so there's very early uh, development of the internet um, as um, former Senator once described it, a series of tubes, right? The uh, dial-up, um, dubstep sound you hear, um, the very early era of information, the development of social media, and now as we see the development of uh, significant changes in technology through the usage of AI, including ChatGPT, the development of uh, virtual reality and um, you know metaverse, all of that stuff has also seen a pretty significant change. So even within the electronic era, there's a lot to break down. Case in point. <laughs> so, um, as we're thinking about this, it's also good to break down the role of both hot and cold media, right? So um, if we're thinking about uh, hot and cold media, this is um, essentially how much demand and labor is put on your end uh, relative to the amount of sensory engagement and participation uh, that the medium itself is doing, right? So um, cold or cool media, that's something such as sending an email, um, sending a text, such as without the use of emojis or GIFs, um, you know, that is information that is um, less engaged with the senses, right? To fill in the gap, to understand and be familiar with the material, you have to do a lot more work for yourself. If you're reading through an email, if you're understanding a method, um, there's a lot more that goes into that. For example, that's part of why emojis have gotten really popular is emojis provide a much more visual, easy way for people to uh, communicate and engage with each other because again, uh, words can be challenging, right? Um, 
like, and also have led to like generational changes, right? The um, the little skull emoji, right? I'm dead. It's really funny. Um, that's been a change in how that form of media communicates. As we think about the spectrum, right? As we move into things such as Instagram, um, you know, TikTok is also over here, right? We have what's considered to be more hot media, where there is more engagement with the senses, more use of video, more use of audio. Um, you know, there is more material that the medium itself is giving you to understand and to make sense of the message. So one way of thinking about the spectrum is to say cool media is more likely to be ambiguous. We're more likely to misunderstand uh, a text um, and not fully grasp what that text is trying to say um, versus, um, you know, somebody is on YouTube and they're being very clear about, you know, what it is that they're sharing or doing. So you might be familiar, a picture's worth a thousand words. So hot media is able to engage much more with our senses. So media ecology theory is suggesting that for us, right, the usage of um, media, the usage of materials to communicate, it's constantly circulating, it's changing, it's developing, right? Um, one law of media is the law of enhancement. In other words, uh, media develops, it becomes more sophisticated, it becomes uh, more able to do different things. Uh, one really good example of this is phones, right? Over time, phones have been able to do a whole lot more things, whether we started with something like a flip phone or even we think about going back to like a pager uh, versus the ability to use a smartphone, um, you know, to easily do video calls. Um, even the development of things like facial recognition technology, right? If media is able to enhance and become more sophisticated, it's generally going to last. It's going to adapt with the times. The law of obsolesc obsolescence suggests that certain media become obsolete, right? They no longer have uh, their intended purpose and um, those things are thrown out. Again, um, we might think about something like a pager. Why would you use a pager? It's 2023. Um, so a lot of technology is considered to be out of date, no longer useful. Um, so it fades into obscurity because newer technology has replaced that and filled in the gaps. Another example of this is with rise of streaming, right? A lot of cable television, that's gone way down. Subscriptions have gone way down to that. Uh, more people are using streaming services for, you know, watching film and television. Um, the law of retrieval, right, is uh, the way in which someone is able to take technology that may have started out as being outdated, uh, but is able to integrate or use that in a more contemporary setting. So maybe there was something that can be salvaged or used from old technology. Uh, for example, if you look at the development of electric vehicles, right, there's been a lot of changes where old tech actually ends up being useful um, and applicable for the development of new cars. And then reversal might be considered to be the idea of moving backward or moving to an older tech piece of technology uh, for any given reason. Uh, one good example of this, and again, I split my time between LeGrand and Portland, so this is very much in my head, is vinyl, right? Records. Um, I like to go up to Music Millennium in Portland. Um, you know, it's a lot of fun to hear records, uh, play records, and a lot of people swear by records because um, they feel that vinyl has a better quality sound than the compressed audio you might get from something like an MP3 or on Spotify. So sometimes there is that reversal and change in how we're using technology. Or perhaps, um, you know, something like an old flip phone is back in style and you're interested in using that. Um, you know, or, um, you know, sometimes the language of burner phones gets used sometimes too. Um, we see that depicted in media a lot. So media ecology theory, again, is thinking about and mapping out the ways the technology has changed, has adjusted, and again, is making the argument that media is forming the ecosystem, the environment in which we communicate and engage with each other. So there's some critique of this theory. One of them is that Media ecology theory is kind of complicated. It's got a lot of different parts. It's got some, you know, pretty detailed terminology and various concepts here. So, you know, there's a fair bit to sift through. And um, generally speaking, a good theory is towing that line between simplicity, but also having depth to it. Um, the other thing to consider, right, is uh, this ongoing debate. Is the medium really the message, uh, as McLuhan says? Some have criticized that as being a little bit essentializing. It's reducing 
um, a message down to how that message is delivered and underestimates the power of the message uh, itself, regardless of how that message is communicated. If you have a family member telling you that your grandmother has passed away, right, that's a message that is powerful and influential in its own right. And yes, there are more or less appropriate ways to communicate that message, but still the message stands on its own outside of the media, right? So there's critique of this theory and critique of the way that McLuhan kind of vaguely talks about how the medium is the message. And then lastly, what motivates us outside of media? Again, um, this is a theory that suggests that media has a lot of power to impact our environment, the way that we think about experiences. But it's also true that we engage in interpersonal relationships, we participate outside of the use of media, right? So sometimes, you know, you're out camping and you don't have a Wi-Fi signal and um, you're just around the campfire and talking to other people, right? Uh, sometimes you intentionally turn your phone off or put it on silent or airplane mode. Um, so sometimes we are engaging, we're making choices, we're behaving regardless of um, its relationship to media. Perhaps we have family members, including older family members, who uh, refuse to engage with certain forms of fake social media, right? And by doing so, um, are motivated by other factors and their relationships. So all important factors to consider as we're looking at uh, this relationship and thinking about uh, some of the ways that this plays out. All right. So um, we have Kyle, who will be presenting with us today on media ecology theory. So Kyle, you are welcome to click or use the arrow keys as you are working in play. So just one second to get my timer going. Whenever you're ready. Alrighty, so as you can guess, uh, I'm just doing media ecology theory. So the article I wrote on was Media Ecology and the Future Ecosystem of Society. Um, so effectively, these are the foundations for why this article was written and why the experiments were carried out. Um, so throughout the article, it uses kind of a heap of metaphors to compare media usage to other things. Uh, the main metaphor of this article was the relation of media to an organizational ecosystem, which I'll explain in depth a little bit later. Uh, so the first key idea is that media journalism focuses on the role of technology and sort of how that's affected it, um, news production. Uh, what it doesn't focus on, however, is what sorts of social consequences are an effect of uh, media and how it's going to continue to shape our society. Part of this is down to the fact that that is an extremely difficult thing to measure, uh, but also nobody's really thought to give this sort of um, social buildup, uh, build excuse me, um, some thought. Uh, media ecology views media as not just a form of communication, but it is comparable to a sort of social environment, the environment that society kind of communicates in. Uh, the article also uses media ecology to explore the relationship between the change in media and the change in society. So as media changes, how that sort of um, shapes society. Um, so it did a comparison of media usage from 2008 to 2014 uh, in the United States. So that is important to note, it is a developed country. Um, this is a little bit difficult to measure in sort of developing countries as not everybody has access to the same sorts of media. Uh, they did find the average digital, digital media usage increased from 2.7 hours a day to 5.6 hours, which is practically double. Um, and then mobile media usage increased by almost tenfold, uh, going from 0.3 hours a day to 2.8. Um, so obviously this exemplifies how media is just becoming increasingly more common in day-to-day -day life. Um, it also argues that as more social interaction continues to occur, the different spheres of life begin to blur, which is the ecosystemic organization. Effectively, what that means is the lines, the definitive borders between public and private life sort of start to fade away. Um, think social media profiles, what you kind of give away on there, what school you go to, how old you are, what sort of things you're uh, involved in, etc. So the ways this connects to media ecology theory uh, is most effectively through the concept of global village. Uh, as mentioned earlier, it's the ecosystemic organization is effectively, definitively global village because it discusses how people are no longer able to be isolated from one another. They're always connected through the sort of media. Uh, they're held together by that media usage. And as I said, the barriers between kind of public and private life begin to diminish. 
Um, this added onto the idea of bias of communication, uh, which is the metaphor of media being this ecosystem blends with how this concept is defined in that technology is able to shape society, um, and it's kind of the way society is made. There's also the idea of technopoly, which refers to the idea that society is dominated by technology. So technology is kind of the dominant factor in society as a whole. And then this increase in media usage across the board in, as I mentioned, developed countries shows that as time continues to kind of go on, the number continues to grow as well of media usage. Um, and then technology is integrated into our lives continuously. So what I gained from this article, um, I believe it shows media ecology theory holds weight. Um, think how often you use media on your own. Technology is present now more than ever in society. As Professor Mann mentioned, uh, we use Zoom for years on end, um, just as a way to communicate and continue being involved in society. And this trend continues to grow uh, as time has kind of continued to pass on, more and more technology has been introduced uh, in ways to connect with one another. And then the second law of media ecology theory, uh, enhancement means that media enhances society. Um, this has shown to be true because as I said, media keeps continuing to develop. And um, that's what I got. Kyle, uh, thank you for choosing to explore this article and explain its uh, relationship to the ecology theory. And he just does a really good job here at helping us to think about how uh, media ecology theory has evolved, in particular in analyzing how media has been used, applied, and situated in a contemporary way. So I think um, kind of bringing in some of those key findings and ideas about how people are using technology and trying to place uh, media ecology theory within the landscape of individual usage is really useful. And again, it helps us to better understand um, some of the practical applications here. Um, one thing that was brought up in the presentation, also brought up in the video that I think is also worth discussing is the idea of the global village, right? So Nick Lewin theorized that through the use of technology, our ability to connect with one another is essentially using media as a way of creating a set of shared languages um, and um, relationships between people. One other critique that can be brought against media ecology theory, though, is that we have seen over the last several years a lot more fracturing and more diffuse use of media, right? There are a lot more streaming services. There are a lot more YouTube channels. Um, you know, there's a lot more content um, that people use and follow. So sometimes that means that the media we're using and engaging with is very different than people around us, right? We're using and picking different forms of social media, if at all. We're picking different things that we like to watch and do. Um, you know, we're we're presented with a lot more choices, which might mean that we're not necessarily speaking the same language uh, of media with all of those options available. All things to think about as we're continuing to explore these theories and what these theories have to say about our use of media. So um, as mentioned, right, um, I think a lot of uh, changes to technology over the years do a good job of explaining this theory in action. In particular, I would highlight TikTok. Uh, again, it's gained a lot of traction over the last uh, two to three years. It's even gained a lot of, you know, congressional debate, discussion, um, uh, the federal and state level about sort of banning its usage in public settings and security concerns, um, but nevertheless has gained a lot of attention and traction, particularly with younger generations, right? So the usage of TikTok, I think, is especially interesting. Um, we can think about this in a lot of ways. And again, communication research has explored this in a lot of ways, too. Um, I will tell you, um, to kind of rant for a minute, um, I talked to a lot of the communication faculty, older communication faculty, who like make it a point of saying, I don't know what TikTok is, or I don't really engage or think about it. And from my perspective, right, um, you know, as we grow and as we study communication, we gotta adapt to the times. We have to understand and engage with new technology, information, all of that, um, and think about how that technology changes, develops, and influences the way we communicate. If we say, oh, I'm not gonna engage with this, or I'm too old for this, then we lose touch with what communication is doing and how communication is shaping us. So, um, you know, it's not like I'm old, um, I'm only 31, but um, I think it is useful to understand some of the ways that technology has changed. Um, so as we think about what TikTok does, um, we can think about how the circulation of like memes through audio is one way of engaging with multiple senses. 
um, using videos, using imagery, and also the use of algorithms and targeting, right? Uh, finding relationships or finding people to follow or pay attention to that fit with some of your interests. Um, for example, a lot of uh, discussion about disability and mental health is circulated via TikTok as well. Um, so there's a lot of content that is able to reach people in a highly specific way. One thing that's also relevant to the study of uh, media and technology uh, that we'll also talk about later in the term is the idea of a parasocial relationship, right? So sometimes um, it is you form a connection with somebody else, including uh, perhaps somebody you follow on social media. They don't know who you are necessarily, but you do feel uh, a strong connection and pull to that person. Um, so sometimes that can develop through the use of new technology. So all that to say, the landscape is constantly changing, and media ecology theory presents us with a framework for understanding that change that we can incorporate as a pair of glasses, we can critique or push back against, or we can kind of push a little bit further. So with that in mind, uh, for your tenants for today, um, I want you to think about um, some of the ways that you utilize and engage with media. First of all, do you find yourself using hot or cold media more? Um, what do you notice is kind of the differences between those two? Um, we talked about McLuhan's idea, the medium is the message. Do you agree with that? Why or why not? And lastly, how has uh, your media use changed over time? So perhaps you are phasing out and phasing in of certain media use. Perhaps you don't really use media much at all. Uh, but what do you see as the change in your own life and context? So I'll give you some time to think about and uh, write down some of your thoughts here for attendance today.
है Okay, so take a, another minute or two to finish up your work here. So as we're talking about and thinking about this together, um, raise your hand if you find that you are more likely to use hot meat. Okay. Just about all of you, right? So um, this is especially useful if we think to use this in gratification and we think to our motivations and reason for using meat. Oftentimes, we like media for leisure, right? Um, I'm, um, you know, watching a YouTube video essay uh, talking about a TV show while I'm having lunch. I'm, you know, um, playing Zelda after work, right? Like doing something that's fun, that's recreational uh, and requires less mental work on our end is a really good thing that um, hot media facilitates. Um, how about the medium is the message? How many folks, um, if one is strongly disagree and five is strongly agree, where did you find yourself kind of on that spectrum? Okay, it's a lot of people kind of in the ones, threes, fours, um, so good range, um, agreement, disagreement, right? So for those who kind of more strongly affiliate with it, right? Um, media can really shape and impact the message we're giving, but for folks who rank it low, um, it's important again to think about the power and the meaning that's uh, 
given to the message itself, especially if we're communicating interpersonally, communicating about topics that it's important. So there's again ongoing debate. And then as we think about media use and some of the ways that it changed over time, uh, looking over a couple tenants prompts, there's been some shifts, right? Sometimes you create new accounts, sometimes you remove an account um, and stop engaging in a certain form of media. Sometimes an account gets hacked or deleted. Um, so there's a lot of changes. Um, one thing that I've also noticed is sometimes people will have like different types of accounts to do different things. Some people have like a professional account and other people have like a more personal account for some of their close friends. Um, sometimes we manage our family relationships in use of social media in the context of those relationships too. So there's a lot of ways we can think about some shifts and changes in media, and I'm sure a lot to think about ahead. So um, this would be good theory if you were interested in understanding broader media use, how culture, group, or set of people utilize media. So we have the chance to talk about media uh, ecology theory and the ways in which it engages um, in forms of communication. On Friday, uh, we will be hearing about communication accommodation theory. So moving more into an interpretive and critical approach and understanding some of the ways that we modify and change our communication to meet the needs of those around us. So have a great rest of your day. Uh, please pass forward or email your account.